Yes. And there's Gordon. And Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. Hey, Chris. Everybody looks a little cheerier today for some reason. I don't know what that could be. Breathing a big sigh of relief. Yeah. Yeah. Now we just have to keep the pressure up for the senators. Yeah, come on, Georgia. I think Gordon doesn't know he doesn't have a sound on yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. you're muted, Gordon. There you go. <laughs> it, yeah, the, the hour will go so much better if I unmute. <laughs> yes, <it will. laughs> uh, I am, I am uh, appreciative that uh, you Knoxvillians are here and not at the dance party in Crooch Park. Oh, oh is goodness. there one? <laughs> I, I don't want, as much as it would be nice to be with a lot of people, I don't feel comfortable with that. No. Yep. Not these days. We're still in a pandemic. Yep. Yep, we are. Exciting one at that. Well, there is stuff going on. Yep. So, well, I think we're seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that's what it says. Seven and seven. <laughs> okay. Well, give them that. Onward. You know, <laughs> honoring those who show up on time. If others come in, well, be good to have them. Um, so, I, you know, also it is reported that. The president-elect will have something to say at 8 o'clock, and I will try to wrap, because he is probably going to be more interesting than we are. So. <laughs> well, I, I do plan to uh, hear him one way or another. Me yeah. too. So I was hoping that this would be just an hour. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so tonight... We're jumping off from the uh, principle of the goal of world community, not just here, but world community with small goodies, peace, liberty, and justice, not for just a few, but for all, it's sort of global. And uh, you know, John Haynes Holmes was an interesting advocate for all those values and did some fabulous work and also fell short in some interesting ways. Uh, before we tie, uh, tie in to John Haynes Holmes, uh, an interesting thing about history is that um, you find connections that you didn't know were there. Uh, as I was working on this, I discovered two connections. Now, I'm here in Knoxville talking about John Haynes Holmes. And as far as I know, there's no evidence that John Haynes Holmes ever visited Knoxville maybe ever thought about Knoxville, Tennessee, but I found two connections, one, you know, really pretty loose, but you know, it's there, we can, we can talk about it. John Haynes Holmes was succeeded as minister of Community Church, New York by Donald Santo Harrington. Donald Harrington was succeeded in the ministry of Community Church New York by Bruce Southworth, oh my. who grew up here in Knoxville, went to the religious education program at Tennessee Valley Unitarian Church, as it then was, and then into the ministry. 
one of many people we seem to have scattered into the ministry. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of a connection. The more far-fetched connection I discovered as I was reading the Holmes biography and the Dictionary of Unitarian Universalist Biography, and I got down to the end and saw who had written it. That was my friend Paul Sprecher. And I, as a matter of fact, Chris Bison, I know that Paul Sprecher has visited in Knoxville. Uh, some personal business that he, that he and his wife, Dee Dee, had here. And uh, I also know Paul Sprecher's wife, late, now late wife, Dee Dee, uh, had a more direct connection to Knoxville. Her father was a guy named James Agee. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that Paul Sprecher is now executor of the Agee Literary Estate. So yeah, some Knoxville connection to this guy. So, you know, there, there are connections. Uh, almost any time you dig deep enough in history, you'll find, oh, I didn't know that this was connected to that. Uh, one of the reasons I keep puttering around in it. So, you know, start off with sort of basic John Haynes Holmes biography. Interesting guy, I thought. His father was from a universalist family, a uh, very nice dynamic guy, but not a super successful salesman. Good dad, apparently. Uh, his mother, John Haynes Holmes' mother, was a Unitarian. Uh, her father, John Haynes, <laughs> guess where John Haynes Holmes' name came from? John Haynes had been the treasurer of Theodore Parker's congregation in Boston, the 28th Congregational Society, which was formed for the sole reason of giving Theodore Parker a chance to be heard in Boston. And um, John Haynes was a very successful businessman. He was a music publisher and was generous to family members, which was important as young, his young namesake came up. John Haynes Holmes grew up in Malden, Massachusetts. Uh, the family regularly attended the Unitarian Church, were quite involved there. Uh, and little, little John, you know, grew up, he took music lessons, was good on the piano. Uh, in high school, he I had to choose between the general studies curriculum and the college curriculum. And he went general studies because, you know, he thought he'd, you know, he'd do high school and then join grandfather in the music publishing business. But one semester into high school, the principal, and I think one or two of his teachers, arrived at the family home and said, John is a very, very promising student. He must move to the college course. Oh, but he, you know, he's a semester behind. Not, not a big problem. We'll, you know, he would only, he's only missed out on the Greek and so on. And we can, we can help him catch up on that. So he shifted to the college preparatory uh, course in high school uh, with the principal already saying, oh, he, he could go to Harvard. And indeed, he did well in high school. He was admitted to Harvard. Grandpa came through with financial help on that. And uh, actually, he finished Harvard in three years. Now, I can imagine, I can imagine 
really working hard and getting through UT in three years if you're bright. Harvard in three years boggles my mind. He did it. Um, in, in high school, uh, John Haynes Holmes plunged into the debate society and the literary society, uh, wrote editorials in the school paper and apparently irritated a lot of people because the editorials were way up here and you know, he wasn't talking about things that the rest of the students cared about. Um, but he talked about how he went at things in high school and it continued in college. His high school had a literary society. How fast and furious were our battles in the Malden High School Literary Society. I was always in the midst of them and always on the unpopular side. In other words, I was always a member, not infrequently a leader of the minority. I was forever adoring the government and never so happy as when denouncing it. And all of this by a kind of inspiration or inner prompting of the spirit. Seldom did I think a question through before taking sides upon it. This would take time and perhaps cost me an opportunity to get the best of my foes. At any rate, I didn't need thought to establish conviction. I seemed to know where I belonged. And always, this seemed to be with the minority. So he got a little more clarity on how to really seriously be a debater at, in, in his time at Harvard. And um, went from Harvard undergrad undergrad to Harvard Divinity School. Um, at the Divinity School, he did well. He uh, hit the Divinity School at an interesting time. He said, I came to the school at a time of genuine revival. Much earlier, President Eliot had taken the school away from the Unitarians. It had basically been the Unitarian theological school um, and set it up as an independent center of universal religion. Its scope was to be as wide, its point of view as objective, its methods as rationalistic as natural science itself. So it was a somewhat more vigorous uh, active school than it would have been a few years earlier. Uh, at the school, he came under the influence of Francis Greenwood Peabody. Uh, interesting person in his own right. He was, Francis Greenwood Peabody was a Unitarian minister and the son of a Unitarian minister. He was briefly a parish minister, but his health wasn't good enough to keep up the grind of parish ministry. So he became a teacher at Harvard. Okay, this is an interesting one. You know, I know parish ministry can be hard. I remember 60 hour work weeks somewhat routinely, um, but uh, really for a rest cure, you start teaching at Harvard. Um, but Peabody was important. He brought the social gospel to Unitarianism. 1900, uh, he published a book, Jesus and the Social Question. And he was perhaps the first person to teach Christian social ethics in a university or seminary. Um, but no good deed goes unpunished. Peabody's 
courses on Christian social ethics, what, what must the church do to alleviate social problems, were known to the students at Harvard Divinity School as Peebo's drainage, drunkenness, and divorce. <laughs> so, but yeah, this, this and Grandfather Haynes' connection to Parker further cemented in John Haynes Holmes' mind, okay, the church needs to be involved with social questions. So he was a promising student. Uh, while he still had one semester to go in the divinity school, he was called by one of the Unitarian churches in Dorchester, Boston neighborhood. He was called, installed, and ordained while he still had a semester of divinity school to go. Um, and, uh, you know, that's not typical. Uh, he apparently did well there. Three years later, three years experience in the ministry, age 28, he was called to a major church in New York City, a church that was then known as the Church of the Messiah, but a very prominent pulpit that had just been vacated by a notable preacher who had previously been in Boston. He really, <laughs> he really leapfrogged from a small congregation in Boston to a very significant pulpit. So he served there till his retirement from 1904, uh, I'm sorry, 1907. From 1907 to 1949, the rest of his career was spent with that church. He led the church into much deeper social involvement a name change, and growth into a multicultural congregation. Some of his issues and accomplishments, well, a very significant accomplishment was that he served a congregation that did not, certainly not initially, agree with all of his opinions, all of his excitements. Uh, he was an avowed socialist serving a predominantly capitalist congregation. The first sermon that he, he published after he got to New York was Christianity and Socialism, which he said were basically one and the same thing. Uh, two years after he got to New York in 1909, he was one of the founders of the NAACP. The NAACP was started in 1909 because, well, partly sparked by a race riot in Abraham Lincoln's hometown, Springfield, Illinois. Something is really wrong when the town from which Abraham Lincoln went to the White House has a race riot. So a group of white social justice advocates, you know, Jane Addams, John Dewey, folks like this with some black leadership, Ida B. Wells Barnett, uh, Mary Cloud uh, Bethune uh, started the NAACP. John Haynes Holmes and Mary White Ovington, who was later a member of his congregation, she was a birthright Unitarian, 
moved her membership to community to Haynes Church, um, were on the board. Mary White Ovington was the first staff filling virtually all of the positions on the staff, uh, except for the publications position, which which was a paid position. Hers were unpaid. The paid position went to W.B. Du Bois because the NAACP picked up on uh, the Niagara movement that Du Bois had started in 1905. It's, it says something about the state of racial issues in America. The Niagara movement called that because it was founded in the community of Niagara was founded on the Canadian side of the border because the blacks who formed the Niagara movement couldn't stay at any of the hotels in Niagara, New York. That's where we were in 1905 when the Niagara movement was formed. So, the NAACP early on began a decades long crusade against lynching. This became the, the, the hallmark of the first decades of the NAACP. It also did smaller local campaigns. And let's see, where was that? Okay, I think here. In the early days, this is from John Haynes Holmes autobiography. In the early days, we used to go to a theater box office, this would be in Manhattan, and purchase tickets for the play on some date in the near future. On this date, we would present ourselves and our tickets at the entrance of the theater with one or two Negroes in our company. The Negroes were under strict instructions to say nothing but to hold their places at any cost. Meanwhile, we whites were politely but firmly protesting the refusal of our tickets, which had been bought and paid for only a few days uh, previous. Then began the excuses and explanations, so-called. There had been a mistake in the dating of the tickets. Uh, the seats in question were already occupied, etc., cetera, et cetera. Now and again, hard pressed, the ticket taker would blurt out the truth that they did not admit Negroes to their performances. We had taken pains, of course, to arrive at the theater just before curtain time uh, when the audience was crowding in. Within a few moments after our altercation began, the lobby was jammed with excited and indignant ticket holders. Shouts were raised, protests heard, the manager was summoned, there was nothing to do but call the police. In the face of force, we withdrew, which was just what we wanted. For this got the theater into the courts there to be adjudicated in terms of justice and fair play. So he was actively involved in these aspects of the NAACP. He was also somewhat after that a founder of the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Uh, it started with defense of conscientious objectors during World War I. Uh, started as the, uh, as the American Union Against Militarism and became the National Civil Liberties Bureau and then American Civil Liberties Union a century ago in 1920. For a long time, several decades, uh, Roger Baldwin, a member of John Haynes Holmes Church, was the executive director of the ACLU. And Holmes himself was uh, a board member uh, for 40 years. I think he cared about this. He was a board member for 40 years and was chair of the board, 1939 to 1949. He was also one of the founders of the American Fellowship of Reconciliation, a pacifist uh, group advocating nonviolence. It was founded 
again, during World War I, as a spin-off from the British Fellowship of Reconciliation. And he was very early an advocate for the importance of Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, 1921, he preached a sermon about Gandhi. The greatest man in the world was his sermon title. And in 1953, he published a book, My Gandhi. So clearly, John Haynes Holmes was a believer in and advocate of world community, peace, liberty, and justice for all. And he was a fairly absolute believer in and practitioner of his principles. Uh, the Dictionary of UU Biography uh, entry noted, uh, he was accused of many things in his life, but never of being moderate. And uh, in his own memoir, he noted, to be an absolutist in the moral life is to secure an understanding and protection, not otherwise or elsewhere possible. So he succeeded admirably in having his strong opinions accepted in his congregation, even by people who disagreed with him. You know, there were a few. There were a few who drifted away. But in a real crunch, the First World War, April 1, 1917, he preached a sermon in which he called war an open and utter violation of Christianity. That was April 1. April 2, President Woodrow Wilson called on Congress to issue a declaration of war and bring America into the war in Europe. Also, on April 2, the Board of Trustees of his church met. It turned out there was only one person on the Board of Trustees who agreed with Holmes' stance of absolute pacifism, non-support for the war. But the Board was unanimous in upholding his right to preach that. It's an interesting, interesting passage. Okay, let's see this one. Uh, he said, uh, you know, he and the press were waiting outside as the church board met and one person came out of the meeting I have little to say began the spokesman of the board except to emphasize that what we've done was done by unanimous action we all agreed that the question before us was a simple question of freedom that to this there could be only a single answer for nearly a hundred years this church has been a free church what Mr. Holmes said yesterday was his business and not ours. The trustees of this church, both as individuals and as officers, repudiate this, these ideas. This is our freedom as members of this congregation. But of Mr. Holmes' right to say what he did, there can be no question. This is his right as minister of this congregation. So we see no need or indeed excuse for taking action in this case. Mr. Holmes will remain here as the minister of a free pulpit in war and peace. And will pray with us that the grace of God may abide with us and therewith help us on our way. A lot of ministers would love to have a board that supportive, agree with them or not. Within the congregation, his very clear 
often rather hard-edged commitments, were at least accepted. There were members who had been there when he was called who drifted away. Uh, Henry Watt Rogers, who was the number two person in the Standard Oil Company of John D. Rockefeller, mm, began attending with less frequency. Uh, Mrs. Rogers continued to attend and then she became infrequent and then they disappeared. But even in this crunch in 1917, yes, there were members who resigned and said, no, we, we, we can't be associated with this guy and his opinions. There were more who joined. And he attracted and held a diverse membership Within the broader Unitarian family, John Haynes Holmes had less success. This issue of war was a break point there. In September of 1917, something that, that existed then ceased a few years later, the General Conference of Unitarians met John Haynes Holmes was uh, chair of a ministerial committee that was supposed to bring agenda items to the meeting. And he spoke about four positions that Unitarians could be documented as taking on the matter of the war, which was you know, the hot topic at that point. Uh, one of the four positions was pacifism. John Haynes Holmes urged that a resolution be passed that supported all four of these positions. Well, <clears throat> the presiding officer at the General Conference of Unitarians was William Howard Taft, former U.S. President, future Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Taft called John Haynes Holmes' position insidious and moved a resolution that the war must be carried to a successful issue. Taft's motion passed 236 to 9. That's clearer than the results announced today. <sighs> Unfortunately, <laughs> the following year, and I think the following spring, the board of the American Unitarian Association followed up on this by voting to deny any financial aid to churches with pacifist ministers. And John Haynes Holmes responded to this by resigning his fellowship, his ministerial credential with the American Unitarian Association. I'm not somebody you can call a Unitarian minister officially anymore. Now, a little moderation crept in later, 18 years after this action, the American Unitarian Association Board repudiated the 1918, uh, you know, we're not going to aid congregations with pacifist preachers. Um, and during World War II, uh, the American Unitarian Association did much better. It did support a multitude of positions. But John Haynes Holmes really felt alienated from Unitarianism. He asked for his congregation to leave the association. Mm, the congregation didn't want to do that. 
they remained a Unitarian congregation officially, but they did agree to change their name to Community Church of New York and to focus on a, a broader theological and social emphasis, welcoming the entire community. It's fascinating that none of this story, oh, the, the name change and the changed focus is here in its autobiography. The 1917-1918 kerfuffles with Taft and the AUA, they're not in here. I wish I knew why. Fascinating thing to skip over in your life story. Maybe left out because, well, and in close affiliation with its work, constitutes one of the chief prides and joys of my life. Yet I am still beset by a sense of guilt that I have all too often failed my Negro brethren, but not always. Thus, there is the day I tied up the elevator service in one of the great hotels of the nation's capital. My room was on the top floor of the hotel. A newspaper reporter and his assistant, a Negro, had come there to interview me and take pictures. After some 15 minutes or so, we left together to return the main floor or, or lobby. When the car arrived, I noticed that the Negro deposited some paraphernalia and then turned away as though to board another car. Plenty of room here, I exclaimed in my innocence. Come, jump along. He ain't allowed to ride here, explained the elevator boy. Over there, he said, pointing to the, he pointed, the freight elevator. The freight elevator, I shouted, not on your life, hop in. Hop in, I said to the Negro, who was now badly frightened. If there had been a crack in the floor, he would have crawled into it. But there was another man who was frightened also, the elevator man. And you see, he said politely, I'm not allowed to run this car with a Negro on it, so he's got to get out. Not while I'm here, I said, now beginning to enjoy the occasion. If you put this man out, you'll have to throw me out too, and you know that's serious business. By this time, irate passengers were clamoring for attention. Suddenly another car arrived, and the head elevator man, brilliantly uniformed, alighted. What's going on here, he shouted. I started to explain in gentle and dulcet tones, but was rudely interrupted. Niggers can't ride in elevators. Not, not with white passengers, they can't. Well, they will today, was my retort. You will either let this man ride with me or else throw us both out, and that won't be pretty. Not, not, if you, not for you, it won't. By this time, I was riding high. I think I felt the way mobsters feel when they start a riot. A silence fell upon the group. The chief elevator man obviously did not know what to do. I had him stuck. Finally, as though in despair, he signaled to his underlings to resume service. The last I saw of the chief, he was wearing an anxious look as he passed through a door marked manager. Well, this is, this is delicious, and I understand why Holmes 
felt sort of good about it. But unlike the theater protests in New York City, the black man was involuntarily involved and a low level hourly employee was very much put on the spot. This wasn't, this wasn't something that would totally change that practice. It wouldn't lead to a test case in court that might tell the theater, no, you have to seat everybody. It put individuals involuntarily on the spot. And uh, hmm, that's not that good. Now, there were other situations in which he did some things in conjunction with the ACLU. Uh, there was a, a marvelous, marvelous instance of uh, setting it up so that only the people who needed to be put on the spot were. Word came to the ACLU office that the suburban town of Mount Vernon was discriminating against socialists. Out of door meetings were being held there at places indicated for Republicans and for Democrats, but there were, there were none for socialists. Their meetings were broken up and their speakers arrested by the police. It was quite the custom of the union in such cases to send speakers of our own to defy these discriminatory regulations and thereby get the issue into the courts for settlement. In this event, word was sent to the mayor of Mount Vernon that on a certain evening, named in our letter, three representatives of the ACLU would appear and address such audiences as might gather or listen. The speakers in question would be Norman Thomas, Rose Schneiderman of the Women's Trade Union League, and myself. We kept our appointment and so did the police of Mount Vernon, for officers were on hand, ostensibly to preserve order and enforce the law. I was the first to speak, or was it Norman? Stating the purpose of the meeting, I started to read the Constitution of the United States. But before I could get to the opening words, we the people, I was placed under arrest and carried off to the station house, one of the handsomest buildings of the kind I ever saw. Norman Thomas promptly took my place and started to read the Constitution of the State of New York when he was pulled down and taken to the station house to bear me company. The Schneiderman received the same treatment. At the station house, we were duly booked and released on bail for the night. At the hearing the next morning, the judge declared us guilty and imposed fines, which were promptly appealed. At the higher court, which was our own from the beginning, this judgment was reversed and a precedent of law established. The streets of Mount Vernon were henceforth free to the speakers of all parties. So there, there they, you know, the victims were the police, the mayor, the, the judge, the people who really needed to be called to account. So, you know, I do differentiate those two situations, the spontaneous elevator protest that really put the wrong people in a hard place and the situation in Mount Vernon that really called the bluff of the authorities. Actually, <clears throat> I took part in a similar ACLU setup in Mississippi one time, a town that was uh, telling the Klan that they'd be arrested if they distributed literature. And uh, the national office said, well, uh, it'd be a much better case, much easier to defend uh, if it's ACLU literature uh, that uh, 
draws the threat of arrest. So you know, three or four of us drove down to the town, um, handed out literature until we were told, okay, you do any more of that, we'll, we'll have to arrest you. So, okay. <laughs> and uh, filed suit the following Friday afternoon, successfully. So, uh, anyhow, I have a few concluding observations, but you know, I, I have yacked on about this man. Um, any questions uh, that you all have that I might conceivably be able to answer? Did Holmes run afoul of like anything that happened during like the Red Scare that uh, took place? Uh, like, right well, after? he was he was still involved with ACLU uh, in that era, and he you know he talks about the ACLU's expulsion of communists. He portrays it as. A, a response to the growing extremism of those members of, of the organization who were uh, admittedly members of the Communist Party. Uh, critiques of the ACLU uh, often take the viewpoint, you know, they, the ACLU was under pressure from Justice Department, FBI, to get the communists out. Uh, I think Holmes' Holmes' account is uh, uh, gentle to the ACLU. <laughs> Said, "Well, you know, the, you know, those CP members had just gotten more extreme and more difficult to work with, so." I, I would rate this as a less than exemplary chapter in the life of the ACLU and say, yes, this man was involved uh, in those decisions. So, it was not an easy time to, to be on the left. So, I'm kind of fascinated by that whole uh, church name change. I've been in uh, university meetings that went on for months discussing whether there was an S on the end of a word or not, communications, science versus sciences, and was kind of around when we talked about making Tennessee Valley into a Unitarian Universalist. And those were big kerfuffles. The, the one they did in New York sounds like it must have been uh, much more traumatic than that. Yeah. It, it, it should have been, at least in his telling, it wasn't. And I think it's, it, it's in the uh, Dictionary of UU Biography account of his life. I don't think I picked it up in his autobiography. He had an offer in that space of time a friend, a co-worker whom he respected, Jenkins Lloyd-Jones uh, in Chicago, died about 1919. And his congregation and related organizations wanted John Haynes Holmes to come and pick up on that work. So he said to his board in New York, well, I have this offer. Now, if you want me to stay, uh -huh. we want to do this and this and this. <laughs> and, you know, he got the name change. He got the, uh, the, the change of focus. It was okay if he wasn't officially a Unitarian minister but the church turned him down on their withdrawal from the Unitarian Association. So there, there was a little hardball played there. Yeah, sounds like. 
probably speeds up the decision between science and sciences or, <laughs> and you know, quite frankly, that is the kind of struggle in a congregation that can go on and on and, and you know, cost membership, uh, you know, you, the, the minister can doctrinally shift from, you know, being a Christian to being a pagan. And yeah, okay, two or three people will actually <laughs> give a hoot. Uh, but a suggestion for changing the color of the carpeting in the sanctuary. Well, yeah. <laughs> my grandmother selected that color. <laughs> uh, ch churches are interesting creatures. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that. Very interesting. <laughs> yes. You, you, you've been around this one. <laughs> a little bit. You know, thinking about him, uh, I would say, good and about this principle, good principles are important. Yeah, you might even say vital. It's, I'm glad that we hold this principle of a goal, a vision off there of world community, peace, liberty, and justice, not for not just a few, but for everybody. Yeah, that's cool. But um, applying even the best principles is tricky. It's hard. Reality is complicated and can play tricks on us. And as I was putting together notes for this, I was thinking about somebody, at, you know, probably even more ardently a pacifist than John Haynes Holmes. My predecessor as minister of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart, Indiana, was an absolutely beautiful human being the Reverend Robert T. Dick. Bob Dick and his wife, Helen, were devoted pacifists. And this created an interesting problem. They had deliberately in their eight years with the congregation, Bob and Helen had kept a salary low with the goal of keeping it low enough that they would pay few or no taxes that would go to support the military establishment. Okay, cool. But this set a budget floor that was a little bit hard when a few months after their retirement, the congregation wanted to call a minister who had two school-age kids. They worked with this. The congregation understood and they worked with it, but you know, <laughs> this was an unintended consequence of an admirable, uh, Ambition. Okay, don't feed the military machine. And thinking about Bob, during World War II, Bob had been a conscientious objector who, rather than accepting non combatant service in the military, did alternative service. In the course of his alternative service, he also volunteered as a guinea pig in medical experiments. One of the medical experiments involved oxygen deprivation. You know, how, how oxygen deprived can someone be and still, still function? 
when Bob was discharged from alternative service at the end of World War II, he received a certificate thanking him for his contribution to the war effort. Medical people needed to know how low oxygen levels could go in planning high altitude bombing runs. Bob inadvertently, good pacifist, contributed knowledge to the war effort. Yes, history reveals and good principles sometimes create irony. You don't have a sense of irony. Don't go poking too far into history because it's in there waiting to be found. So that's some of the irony that goes with this highfalutin principle is really worth working on, but we know, have to know, has its complexities. So, if you have any further questions or comments, very willing to work with them. Otherwise, no, oh, we have five minutes till Joe. <laughs> And next time, our seventh and final meeting, looking at the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. And I'm thinking we're going to be talking about a couple of people who come at that interdependent web from very different viewpoints. Henry David Thoreau, Chloe, you've been you've been to the cabin. You know about Henry and Tim Berners Lee, who came up with the web that makes this possible. So. Look forward to seeing you. December 7, Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor Day, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. Be, Thank you. That'll be Thank you. on a Monday night next month, so. Okay, that's a little better. <laughs> that's a little better. This, this game of keeping it on the 7th moved the data around. So, you yeah. know. I, I don't think that's all bad. No, it was fun. <laughs> okay. See you next time, if not before. Okay. Chris, I, I hope, your, uh, hope your internet will stabilize. Bye, everyone. <laughs> nice. It's again, yeah. <laughs>